Okay, uh, welcome. Um, Nobel Prize in Economics came out today. No one won it. Um, but no one at this table won it. <laughs> but, uh, it was in the right field. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're Finally. Uh, we Finally. <laughs> I think this is four or five. Yeah. Yeah, four or five. It was well, well deserved. So, uh, happy to wake up to that. Uh, it wasn't one person. <laughs> um, well, it's a pleasure to have Margaret Levy with us. Um, I think the more flowery, flowery introduction will uh, come on Wednesday night at her Oster Memorial Lecture at 5.30 in the, uh, our new global school, uh, 5.30 to 6.30. Hope you all come. Um, so today is some work in progress that Margaret's uh, working on with uh, Barry and uh, Timo, how do you pronounce his last name? We are. We are. Um, so Margaret's uh, professor of political science, director uh, for the Center of Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science at Stanford. Uh, her list of accomplishments is huge. Um, National Academy of Sciences. Academy of Arts and Sciences, President of the Political Science Association, so on and so forth. Uh, so she's a big deal. Uh, <laughs> and we're just honored to, old. <laughs> we're, we're honored to have her here. She's going to be here uh, through most of Thursday for what we're calling the Margaret Levy Fest. So please take advantage of all the activities that Margaret's engaged in. And Margaret, it's yours for five minutes. So I take it this, that you've read the paper, so I don't need to talk about it. So let me just give you a little bit of background to it to sort of situate it. Um, Barry and I have been involved in writing something for a couple of years that is going to be in a book that Naomi Lamoureux and John Wallace have edited, which is really looking, taking, started with a conversation about the violence issue that obsesses Barry. And, obsessed Doug North and he continues to obsess John Wallace as well about how do you get to an open access system and how do you solve the violence question. And he began to be interested in the labor violence, but he said to me, I said, there's a lot of labor violence and in the history and that this, you know, that you can't talk about organizations having re reached the, the open access state with that kind of violence going on. So the dating is all wrong, because that doesn't really get resolved until sometime in the 1930s. And he said, well, labor's a different problem, because they're just rent takers. And that's all. They incited all the labor violence. And I said, OK, Barry, we're going to learn a little history <laughs> and about how employers incited most of the labor violence and how government was not a neutral actor in this. Um, and he, he, I gave him a little bit to read, and he got very upset about what he'd been taught in economics um, <laughs> and what he hadn't learned in history. So that led us to write a paper together for that volume talking about labor violence and its resolution, in a sense, during the 1930s, never completely resolved. And then Tino, who is Quayar, who most of you don't know of, probably, but should, because he could be a Supreme Court justice one day, um, is on the California Supreme Court. Before that, he was the director of the Freeman Spokely Institute in International Studies, something, at, uh, <laughs> at Stanford. Um, he obviously has a law degree. He also has a PhD, which he got from Barry, who sort of forgot to show up the day that the exam was being given, but was found wandering the halls and so brought in. Was I there for you? <laughs> he was. <laughs> I feel very lucky. <laughs> um, Barry had read it. <laughs> he was ready. He just had the wrong day down in his calendar. Anyway, so the, I come up and to have coffee with Barry when Tino is finishing having coffee with Barry one day. And um, I should tell you that Tino is also the chair of the board of the center that I direct. And it turns out, the three of us started talking, and we were all working on different pieces of the same puzzle. And so we decided we would merge our endeavors. So you're seeing the first instance of that merger. Um, and each of us is bringing a different piece to that, and this is a very catch-together paper in many ways. 
ways. It's sort of based on a talk that Tino gave, and then I added this stuff on labor, and Barry added some things, um, and trying to bring it together. And that sort of explains the footnotes, too, which will be changed in later versions to something that I find more useful than what law school people do. Um, so that's, not, that's less than five minutes, but that's sort of the introduction. So the bottom line is we're treating the US as a developing country and how it overcame a variety of problems, some of which we lay out here, the la particularly the labor, the violence question, and particularly the crass corruption question. But there are others, as I'm sure Lee is going to bring to your attention. <laughs> Ken. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. It's a real honor to have you. Uh, Could you all introduce oh, your, give Ken like, Richards, yeah. uh, School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Great. Uh, I, I, I love this kind of paper where you just sort of take a step back and say, what's the big picture? And uh, uh, to be able to explain large sweeps in English uh, <laughs> is a wonderful thing. Uh, the, the, um, I was a little uh, miffed with you, though. Uh, and and, and I'll, let, let me explain. Uh, I, I, I kept looking for the thesis statement, mm -hmm. the thing where you go, and here's what we're going to do. And I, and I was having trouble finding that. Maybe I just missed it. But there was this um, reference to our framework. And I wonder if there's more here. This is a very early draft, of course. Right. Is there more here that, that, that isn't in yet? Is there a framework? That, that, that isn't obvious yet that you could help me with in terms of understanding where you're trying to go with this? Uh, or, or what is the central point that, that, that ties us all these wonderful observations together? Well, I think that's a really, you're right to be miffed because it's, it's sort of, we hand wave at it, but we don't really develop it here. And in part, that's, um, I should be answering questions as they yeah. come up. Yeah. Okay. As, as long as you don't answer. Yeah, that was a one-hour question. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Let me develop the framework as we sit here. So we um, we're really building in large part on what uh, North Wallace and Longass did in their book, but there are lots of ways in which I'm not happy with that. Barry has obviously uh, begun to think about some things a little differently. We had some disagreements with the two of them at points, and Tino's now bringing in his own. And so we haven't really developed a framework. I think I think I can state the thesis in a sense, uh, but I can't really give you the framework under which we're investigating it yet, though that's part of the intent over time is to develop a better framework. So the thesis really has to do with if you're, and it's a general thesis, and it won't be news to people like Lauren who studies developing countries directly, um, that in order to move out of the um, state of being a country that has not really developed full capacity to do the things a state needs to do when we call it an economically and politically developed state, you need to solve a couple of key things. And those have to do with um, creating uh, an administrative capacity that is both uh, trustworthy and the piece that gets downplayed in here is able to implement the big laws and the big think into actual practice. So that, that covers the crass corruption piece as a part of that story of building that administrative capacity. Um, the other part of it is that administrative capacity is necessary, in part, to help solve the violence problem. So that you're not going to solve the violence problem fully. You can pass a big law, like the National Labor but without these other pieces of administrative capacity, um, you won't be able to really solve those problems, um, as the civil rights story clearly tells us. So that was, I've now violated Brian, I didn't violate the rule of not speaking for an hour, but I violated Brian Barry's rule that if it's a good thesis, it should be say sayable in 20 words or less. <laughs> so I'm working on that. <laughs> Federica. So let me ask you a question that I asked Barry about seven years ago uh, in class. Um, so the, the problem of violence, right, this is to some extent what um, North Wallace and Wangus, but then the Cox North and uh, Wangus was right. really like bringing 
um, to, to the agenda as a, as a critical problem. The question that I asked in class uh, was, uh, what kind of violence? And it seems to me that the, this question becomes particularly interesting <clears throat> in the context of this paper, where you're looking at labor unions and, and violence in the context of uh, uh, conflict between labor employers and the state um, as uh, conducive <clears throat> to the creation of state capacity. It seems to me that labor violence, this kind of labor violence that is predicated to some extent on the existence or the uh, contextual development of labor unions, strong organizations that enable people that are being screwed to not get screwed again, is a different type of violence than the type of violence that, um, I don't know, uh, Rwanda ex experiences or has experienced. Um, I wonder if part of the real contribution of this paper and of your uh, framework might be to say a little bit more about how different types of violence affect the processes of political and economic development. We've got Tilly's story, um, we've, got, we've got her story, right? We've got the war makes states, and we've got the, in the absence of interstate war and in the, in the context of uh, um, domestic wars or civil wars, uh, the, the outcomes of this violence are profoundly different. I wonder if um, there, is a, there is a huge story here that says a little bit more about the, imp the differential impact of violence on processes of state development uh, as, it, as it pertains to, the, to labor struggles and the creation of administrative state capacity. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So, um, and I can, I can only give you some you know, immediate thoughts on it because I think it's something we'll just have to struggle through and that will really help us develop a framework. <laughs> um, so I see there being several different kinds of violence, and I agree with you on that. One is the kind of violence in Rwanda, and um, you know, I, I think that's probably the first kind that a state has to be able to, uh, and, and the whole history of European state building is, I mean, if a state is unable, or government is unable to, to resolve that kind of violence, to at least create certain kinds of defenses, and protections among people so that they don't resort to that kind of violence, then it probably can't deal with these other kinds of violence very well. And the other kinds of violence I would put in, so I think that's the almost prerequisite of okay, where you can, that won't give you a developed state, but it gives you the capacity to begin to develop a state that has some of these capacities. Then there are two other kinds of violence at least, um, there are probably more, as I think about it, um, that have to be resolved um, or dealt with. One is the kind we're talking about in the case of labor violence, where there are organized groups representing um, interests and voices that have a claim to citizenship that are being <clears throat> repressed, suppressed, and react with violence or are having violence perpetrated against them. So that would be true of both labor and of uh, blacks in the country, of certain religion, religious organizations um, in the country and other countries, where you know the de definition of citizenship, in a sense, has come to include them, but it's not been a full sense of citizenship, and it's, not, and it's being very in, unequally and inequitably applied. And so there's a continuing conflict. Um, and in all of those, what's crucial here is there are at least three players, right? Always in those cases, um, maybe in all the cases. So there's the group that is trying to exercise its rights, and there is some private set of actors who are trying to repress those rights or lower level than the central government. And then there's, of course, the government, which can choose to not interfere at all, be, be neutral in a seriously neutral sense, as it does in the labor violence cases, finally, or the labor conflict cases, finally. Or it can be neutral in the sense that it's not interfering and it's letting those private parties or lower level government parties do their will. Or it can be active and aggressive about protecting the rights of those groups and transform the scene. And then the third set category of violence, which you also mentioned, and Lee and I were talking about, <coughs> Lee raised with me, is that there's another big player in this story, which is war. I wouldn't say it's the, quite the Tilly story, 
Um, but war is clearly having an impact and sort of focuses the imagination, um, at least the Second World War does, and helps build some administrative capacity that wasn't there before. So I think that has to be made more explicit, too. Mike? Yeah, one, one of the um, things you open yourself up to by not having your thesis stated very clearly is that we kind of make up our own as, as a reading. I'm listening. I mean, you came to hear them all. <laughs> <laughs> and they figure out what it's about. It's a Rorschach test. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. one of the things that I um, uh, picked up in this is sort of a process through which this, this fundamental conflict between business and labor groups that you're defining was tamed into manageable kinds of dispute resolution, right. resolution of manageable disputes. So you get labor away from thinking that they're going to change the entire capital ownership of right. the country, of the resources, to, well, we'll bargain over wages, we'll bargain over working conditions, and so on. And the business is also sort of <coughs> being able to sort of realize that uh, any result that comes out of the government regulatory decisions are not going to totally destroy their ownership or their or their capacity to have these resources. And I think that's a really powerful theme of, of development moving towards of, of, of um, taming violence and getting this other process. And um, um, in parts of this, and it, it helps to know that these, these there were three of you coming at this from different perspective, because a couple, several times there were um, phrases in there about all these actors having to solve their commitment problems. And, which is fine, I know where that's coming from, but I have to say that from reading this, I got the sense that there wasn't much agency going on in this. That whenever a specific example was talked about, it was talked about as you know, a, law, a law case that was resolved or something like that, was, was an example of the, the ways, the, the types of commitment problems that were solved, or the way, or something that happened along the way. There was no sense that I could get of how these groups were struggling with each other, how the states were were intervening in the struggle in different ways. So there was like this lack of telling the story of how these uh, these groups were working out the problem, and and then and, and, and instead sort of the sense that somehow, however these groups acted, in the long run it got better, commitment problem got solved, things got better, violence got more sort of tame. And I wanted to know more about how that happened. How, how did those... Okay, I've got something for you to read. The yep. paper that Barry and I wrote with um, Hanya Mello and uh, Franny... Let's <laughs> just blocked her last name for a moment. Um, two of our graduate students who went into the tech world. Anyway, we um, <laughs> we wrote this... The paper we wrote for the Lamoro and Wallace volume actually develops that story much more okay. fully. And what I did here was just try to reduce it enough so that it was gave you some of the hints of what was going on. But I totally agree that the agency is not in the story. Mm -hmm. um, Could you suggest that story? Sure. The gist of that story <laughs> is that um, several things have been going on for a long time. One was the building of labor unions and their various experiments with how to uh, win the right to gauge in collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those unions did institute, instigate violence, relatively few, but some did, or were provocateurs in some way. But most of them were subject to violence, particularly once you get into the industrial union, mm -hmm. the development of the industrial unions. And that violence took some extreme forms. So there were, the Ford Company actually had its own internal army. Uh, we know about the Pinkertons, but this was even more developed. I mean, there were there was a war against labor being waged by the employers. Um, and the other piece of the story was that the government actors, and here I'm talking mostly about federal government, but it was also obviously true of the state governors and of other in the state and the local police. Um, you know, saw themselves as on the side of business, that labor was a threat to uh, stability and to, and they were, the, the, the frame, the um, common meme was that labor was causing violence. So, and that it was, it was going to destabilize the economy if it was allowed to get the kind of power that it wanted. So, government was not a neutral player, was not a neutral player 
at all. The 1930s begins to change that for several different reasons. One, the industrial unions really become much more powerful. They also develop, and much more strategic, um, not only do they grow in numbers, militants, and members, um, they also become, become extremely strategic. So the Flint sit-down strike is an incredibly important event. There were other strikes that I've documented elsewhere that were equally important, like the Longshore strike and the San Francisco general strike and stuff that was happening. There were others. But the, what, what happened in Flint was an innovation in tactics where they just locked themselves in the building and there was no vi they, they weren't throwing things at anybody. They were just sitting in the building, right? If there was going to be violence, it was the first sit-down strike. Sit down, right? Come. Mm -hmm leads to the civil rights movement right, does exactly. the same thing. So if there's going to be violence, it's going to be against them, and it's visibly going to be against them. You can't, you're not seeing people conflicting mm -hmm. with each other. The other thing that happens that's incredibly important at that moment is that Frances Perkins has become the Secretary of Labor. Now Frances Perkins was a pro-labor person. She had been part of a campaign in I could go on for an hour here, so you're going to have to stop me because you're now in my deep subject. <laughs> One of my she was from subjects. Wisconsin. Yeah, she was from Wisconsin, but she lived in New York, <laughs> which is crucial. Because she was she working. Was <laughs> which was very so crucial. Security, yeah. yeah, no, a lot of things came from her. And she, she was working with, with Robert Wagner Sr. in a campaign to give <clears throat> rights to workers. And then she was standing there at the foot of the Triangle Building when buildings, when people were falling out of the windows because of the Triangle Factory, and they got some labor laws enacted that had been sitting there waiting to be enacted, and they used the media and changed the, the narrative. Okay, so she's the Secretary of Labor at this crucial moment in the Flint sit-down strike, and when the decision to bring out the national, to bring in the National Guard to solve this dispute is raised, she said she argues against it and the governor of Michigan agrees. And they do so it's the first real signal that government has become neutral in these things rather than a supporter of business um, and bringing out the police and the National Guard. At the same time we've got this whole real fear that we can't even find palpable or tangible anymore that the country could go could become, there could be a revolution that could go Bolshevik. That there are a lot of the Communist Party is very powerful, it's very strong in the labor movement, it's the Great Depression, things are not going well. Um, so a lot of business begins to see, see that in fact it would be better to negotiate than to take this hard stance, which is only going to contribute to the possibility of a revolution. So you've got these various mm -hmm. factors that come together contingently, but not really because each of them has a, a history where it, it, it just was waiting for the moment. Um, and then you get the National Labor Relations Act. Again, Bob Wagner is standing there with the law in a position where he could pass a law ready to do it if, if the moment arises. Let me just follow up on that if I could quickly. Um, the way I view the 30s, and particularly uh, FDR's New Deal on, is there wasn't any coherent game plan. It was the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And the first thing he does is not at all deal with labor, no. but he deals with agriculture, uh, he deals with the National Industrial Recovery Act, and he closes the banks. And the, the why that's important is because and he didn't deal with tenants, so he, he didn't... But the National Industrial Recovery Act did have a clause he, about labor. Yes, but I think what's really important is the industrialists are much more willing to concede when you I give them the ability to collude and set prices. So that I think the NIRA, although subsequently unconstitutional, was necessary to get these other things yeah. like the National Labor Recovery Act and the Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act, right. so, so that, meanwhile, the NIRA is unconstitutional. But Roosevelt did, so I agree with the overall what happened, 
But it's as if it happened by accident, I think, not by design. So you're claiming it happened by accident. In um, other words, all this, you know, Roosevelt didn't bring us out of the Great Depression. He never had macroeconomic stimulus policy. Uh, he thought Keynes was an idiot. Uh, you know, you could go on in any economic history book about the and New Deal kept us in the Great Depression uh, because it, it but fought Roosevelt, business. Yeah. But the point is that I think it we ended up getting what you said we got. But I think it was more by accident than by design that we solved the violence problem. Well, that may be true. As you notice in my agency story, I didn't mention it. Except that he appointed yeah. Francis Perkins, and you know I think Robert Wagner and. Yeah. But I mean the way the courts work too, the courts at first <coughs> were, were were knocking everything down. Right. And then the courts, I think, came to a view that, as you just mentioned, we could go to the left or we could go to the right. We could become fascist or we could become communist, and we need to hold this thing called middle-of-the-road capitalism together, and I think we should kind of steer a middle course. Um, so I think the courts the courts were more important maybe than FDR, but FDR was sort of doing Well, in our stuff. longer story, the courts play a very important right. role, and part of what we have to explain is why the courts make the shift that right. they make right. yeah. during that period. And frankly, I can't remember all the details. I mean, that we're now in Barry's territory. Yeah. Um, and in Tino's. I let them do the law stuff. <laughs> but. Yeah, so I mean, but it's, it, I don't know how important it is for our story whether any particular president um, has a design in place. It's really about the kinds of conflicts that create an opportunity for institution building to happen and, and institutional transformation to occur. So I've always been much more about, I think leadership matters in a variety of settings, but also important is a series of contextual factors that make it possible and actors keep pushing. So, you know, if you go back to the Triangle uh, factory fire, it became the catalyst for something that was already in movement and in place. The unions had been arguing for uh, sweatshop, sweatshop yeah. regulation. Um, there was legislation that was there and being fought over already, and you know often you need some kind of event that catalyzes it. That's sort of why I'm focusing on Flint. It would have been something else because the moment was there, but you need something that draws attention, signals that there's been a change, and makes that transformation. You're preaching to the choir. History matters. <laughs> uh, well. Well, organization matters too. That's yeah, part yeah. of what I'm saying. No, too. no, yeah. no. But I mean context and opportunity. Right. Bob and then Daniel and then Bob Kraft, the school of public environmental affairs. Once again, I'm positively delighted to meet your audience. Um, I had a comment, and then after listening to Lee and, and your response, I actually have two comments. <laughs> the, the, the first is um, that I, I think it may be uh, important um, to avoid thinking that somehow administrative capacity just jumps forward out of whole cloth no. in response to a political deal or a 